fellow, fellow health workers. Um, my name is Dr. Munira Muhammad Akram Kadardina. I'm a consultant ophthalmologist with the Ministry of Health Kenya, working at Kiambu County Level 5 Teaching and Re Referral Hospital. I'm also an associate lecturer in ophthalmology uh, for undergraduate students at Kenyatta University. I'm here representing the interests of the Ophthalmic Services Unit in the Ministry of Health Kenya and the Ophthalmic Society of Kenya. So the, today I will take you through COVID-19 as seen through the eyes. Um, it's actually a coincidence that we are pre presenting this now because it is almost exactly a year since the first lockdown occurred in Kenya. If you look at the timelines of the COVID-19 pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic first human cases were identified in a wholesale market of Wuhan, China in December 2019. As we all know, it was identified as a disease of zoonotic origin. There are many conspiracy theories that have come up, but research done by the World Health Organization has shown that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19, is closely related to the SARS-CoV-1 virus, which actually caused an epidemic in 2003 and is carried also by bats. And the MERS-CoV virus, which is carried by dromedary camels and has been causing a problem in the Middle East since 2012. Um, the World Health Organization declared the COVID-19 outbreak a public health emergency of international concern on 30th January 2020 and called it a pandemic on 11th March 2020. The first case of coronavirus was confirmed in Kenya on the 12th of March and the lockdowns began effective 16th of March 2020. In November, uh, uh, as far as Kenya is concerned, the first wave of the infection did not occur immediately. In fact, as Kenyans, we were quite happy and we felt like we were immune to this virus. But when borders opened around the end of June and July 2020, we actually saw the first wave start to rise and peak in August of um, 2020. Then, with containment measures and lockdowns reinstituted, cases numbers of cases went down by September. There was a second wave in November. Again, it quietened down, and now we are in the midst of the third wave of infection. Um, there's been a lot of uh, information overload. You, should, you could say, from social media. Some of it is valid information. Some of it is non-valid information. But to put it in a nutshell, this is actually an infectious disease. We have dealt with many infectious diseases in Africa. We are immune to many infectious diseases in Africa. And the way we handle this in Africa should be very different from the way the rest of the world handles it. I am glad, in retrospect, seeing one year down the line, that in Kenya, we took it to the level of seriousness that it was required. Yes, there should not have been so much of fear-mongering, I feel, because it, has create, it created initially a stigma towards these people. People with COVID-19 were actually being treated like people with HIV, AIDS were being treated in the early 1980s when HIV was declared to be an epidemic. So be on a high alert. Um, be uh, aware that this is a highly infectious virus. Institute the measures that are required, but do not stigmatize the disease. Now, what, how does it affect the eyes? The first person in China to actually identify that this was a disease of public health concern was an, ophthalmologi uh, an ophthalmologist in Hubei, China, who actually identified, he was a glaucoma specialist, and identified that this was an infectious disease of concern. Unfortunately, the very same ophthalmologist contracted the disease, and he passed away from it on the 7th of February, 2020. 
Studies done in Hubei, China in March 2020 revealed that there are ocular manifestations of the disease. 38 patients who were hospitalized in a hospital in Hubei, China were analyzed and they found ocular manifestations in 12 of these 38 patients who had epiphora, which is profuse tearing, conjunctival congestion, which is reddening of the conjunctiva of the eye, and chemosis, which is a slight swelling of the conjunctiva. And the percentage of occurrence was approximately equal with um, epiphora being at 18%, conjunctival congestion being at 16%, and chemosis being at 17%. However, it was noted that these occurred in patients who had more severe systemic manifestations of the disease. When the PCR testing was done for these patients, 28 patients were positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus in, uh, from their nasopharyngeal swabs and two were positive from their conjunctival swabs. That gives us a 79% positivity rate because it was 30 patients out of the 38 who tested positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Over the year, um, more and more patients have been seen with ophthalmic manifestations and they have come to the conclusion that there are two types of conjunctivitis that you actually deal with in SARS-CoV-2. The first type is a follicular conjunctivitis, very similar to the other viral conjunctivitis caused by adenoviruses, and this is due to the direct viral infection. In these cases, the chances of getting a positive P PCR for SARS-CoV-2 are high. Most patients, though, present with conjunctival hyperemia, that is reddening of the conjunctiva, and this is usually as a result of the secondary immune reaction that occurs due to the release of the cytokines in response to the infection. When you check conjunctival secretions in these patients, the PCR usually comes back negative. The same ACE2 receptors, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptors, in the body that are responsible for many of the effects of COVID-19 are present on the eye as well. The SARS-CoV-2 has a high binding affinity to these receptors and it causes immune dysregulation, inflammation, neurologic damage and coagulopathies. In the eye, this translates to ocular manifestations like episcleritis, which is an inflammation of the membrane that covers the sclera of the eye, an increased incidence of dry eye syndrome, neuropathies on the cornea, optic neuritis, uveitis, which is inflammation of the uvea, retinitis, that is inflammation of the retina, multiple evanescent white dot syndromes that are a component of many inflammatory syndromes occurring in the body, and then also we've seen atypical forms of optic nerve edema. In one case, it was found to be secondary to cerebral venous thrombosis. A case report recently done on retinal imaging in a patient of COVID-19 revealed hyperreflective plaques, which were at the level of the ganglion cell layer and the inner plexiform layer of the retina on ocular coherence tomography. When you see this patient on fundoscopy, all you see is just cotton wool spots. A study published in the BMJ Open Ophthalmology Journal in January 2021 analyzed the anterior segment symptoms experienced by 83 pa participants who had COVID-19 confirmed. The, the analysis was by self-reporting method and the three main manifestations reported were photophobia, that is sensitivity to light, sore eyes, and itchy eyes. It has been observed overall that these signs and symptoms on the eyes in COVID-19 are rarely reported. In fact, from all our searches, it is mainly uh, the, the uh, doctor-driven studies that have actually come up with all this information. Patients rarely reported these symptoms and this is for a number of reasons. 
Number one is that the eye manifestations usually appear later in the disease and usually it happens in patients with severe disease at a point when they're busy battling the disease and are not concerned about what is really happening to the eyes. The second thing is that they occur mostly secondary to the effect of the SARS-CoV-2 rather than due to a direct infection. And the third thing is that these are usually seen in patients who are admitted to hospital. So they can also be due to secondary hospital acquired infections. Because of this, there is an underestimation of ocular manifestations or the ocular manifestations are largely ignored, especially those manifestations occurring at the level of the retina and those that occur in patients who are asymptomatic or posysymptomatic. The more important effects of COVID-19 seen are actually the indirect ocular effects. Number one effect is on the eyes of critically ill patient. When the patient is admitted to ICU, and it was seen that 30% of, uh, of all hospital admissions for COVID-19 would actually end up in ICU care. Yeah? So when the patient is admitted to ICU, the focus is in, on saving the life of the patient. But during the, that um, time when the patient is under critical care, corneal infections can occur, exposure keratopathy can occur, and ocular surface disease can occur because these patients are unable to close their eyes. They have an impaired blink reflex or when the respiratory secretions are being aspirated, there is contamination of the eyes because of the close proximity. Another thing is seen in patients on intermittent positive pressure ventilation, there is venous stasis and conjunctival edema. So it is thus important that we incorporate adequate eye care in patients who are critically ill with COVID-19. A summary um, of eye care has been provided for critically ill patients to prevent any eye problems occurring in these patients. You have to ensure that the eyes are fully closed to prevent exposure keratopathies you apply prophylactic chloramphenicol ointment in the inferior furnaces of the eye to prevent any hospital acquired infections. You keep the eyes shut by directly taping the lids with a micropore tape. You place a moisture chamber because eyes are supposed to remain wet. The function of the tears is actually uh, uh, not present when the eye is open throughout. So you place a moisture chamber which is a manually prepared cling film or plastic wrap affixed to the periocular skin using ointment. And in severe cases whereby the eye cannot close at all, despite the above measures, there is a temporary suture which an ophthalmologist can apply. Another thing to do is to avoid aspiration of respiratory secretions across the patient's face and open eyes because these organisms are the commonest cause of ocular condemnation leading to conjunctivitis and corneal infection. Um, the person taking care, you know, PPE has to be worn for the carer to go in to see the patient who is in critical care. So the person who is going in to check on the patient should also check on the eyes to re reinstill the ointment and close the eyes with a fresh tape. If any problem is noted, like dullness of the cornea or whitening of the cornea, this is an emergency and you need to contact the ophthalmologist immediately. The second thing which has been observed as an indirect effect of COVID-19 is due to the hand sanitizer that we have been told is necessary for use for infection prevention in COVID-19. A retrospective study done at the Rothschild Foundation Hospital in Paris between April and August 2020 found a seven-fold increase in eye injuries in children as compared to 2019. Most of these injuries were related to sanitizer use and placement. I say placement because if you look at the picture, you see most hand sanitizers are placed at a height of three feet, which is the exact height of a child who is very mobile, very naughty, who is curious as to what is happening, 
with the sanitizers, right? And then this causes, you see, if you look at the picture, the sanitizer will spray directly at eye level to the child. Children should be monitored when they are using hand sanitizer, right? They should be encouraged to wash their hands with soap and water rather than use sanitizer. But it is not just children who are at risk. I mean, this is a coincidence, but on Tuesday, I saw a young man who works in a shop and he was refilling the sanitizer for that shop and he ended up getting sprayed with the sanitizer in his eyes. He was in severe pain, the eye got swollen, he could not open and shut the eyes and I was called in as an, on an emergency to do the washout because whenever a chemical injury occurs, the first aid that you can apply for that patient is to immediately wash out the chemical causing the injury. Right? Sanitizer chemical injury is very severe because sanitizer contains 65 to 90 percent of ethanol or isopropanol. Uh, ethanol is used therapeutically in eyes when you need to apply, uh, remove the epithelium of the eye or you need to apply um, a, a medication to the eye that requires to go beyond the epithelial layer. But when a sanitizer injury occurs, the amount of uh, time that elapses between the injury and the washout is very significant. Also, the concentration of alcohol is very significant because the injury is dose dependent. The sanitizer chemical injury causes edema. Um, it causes ischemia of the conjunctiva and the limbal stem, stem cells, which are responsible for healing of the cornea and the conjunctiva, then it causes conjunctival chemosis. It can also be toxic to the cornea, what is called toxic keratopathy. The toxicity to the cornea can be mild in the form of a superficial punctate keratopathy. It can be moderate, whereby now it sloughs off the epithelium of the cornea, or it can ultimately lead to corneal ulceration and in Worst case scenarios to corneal perforations necessitating uh, surgical procedures like corneal grafting. The second cause of injury, and this is not very common, is because of the height of the dispenser, accidental injury to the eyes can occur in children, especially because when they're running full tilt, they can't stop. They can get the um, injured by the sanitizers that are dispensed over there. And this causes corneal abrasions. This is a picture of uh, two case uh, reports that were published. I have given the reference later. But this is essentially exactly what I saw in the young man who got sanitizer in the eye. This, you can see that the epithelium has sloughed off completely and when you stain, it takes up fluorescein staining. This is the first picture. With the second picture, this was another boy, young boy who got sanitizer in his eye. Looked like there was no effect apart from the reddening. But when you look at the fluorescein picture, there is superficial, superficial punctate keratopathy with um, adequate lubrication, um, bandage contact lens, and, uh, uh, and uh, prophylactic antibiotic, and vitamin C for healing the patients have healed almost completely. The third indirect effect now, and this is something that we don't really think about on a daily basis, is challenges that the visually impaired face. Because these are people who cannot see. To get around, they use their sense of touch. Now if they're going to be touching and the coronavirus transmits on surfaces. On some surfaces, it stays for close to eight hours. All surfaces need to be sanitized before a visually impaired person can get around. That is very limiting to that person with visual impairment. A way to get around this is if we make white, white canes more widely available and we teach white cane skills so that people can get around without having to touch surfaces. The second thing is that these visually impaired persons rely on guides. There is no question of social distancing in this case. 
how will that person social distance from a person who's supposed to hold his arm and guide it through so early rehabilitation of people who for the long term early rehabilitation is key also white cane skills come in handy here and another thing is that there is decreased frequency of health checkups so these patients end up getting complications of their eye conditions on a more regular basis than before this is due to lack of affordability and another thing is to prevent vulnerable populations from being exposed to the hospital environment unnecessarily all non emergency services were kept to a minimum once the pandemic was declared another secondary effect of covid-19 and this has been the worst so far is that there has been an increased an exponential increased usage of screen this results in accommodative disorders coming into play short sightedness especially in children who are borderline who are able to manage without glasses now have to wear glasses for short sightedness see in the recommended screen time in normal times is actually about 3 and 1/2 hours a day the actual screen time on all gadgets on an average before covid-19 used to go up to 6 to 8 hours per day because of the the, the lure of the screen that is there these days now during covid-19 because of on screen learning because of children being home and not having any other option apart from the screen for entertainment for communication this has increased to about 8 to 12 hours per day so they have been reporting blurring of vision constant headaches uh, an increase in dryness of eyes and even poor sleep quality so for blurring of vision we have actually instituted a 2020 20 rule whereby every 20 minutes the person has to look away from the screen at something that is 20 feet away for up to 20 seconds this actually relaxes the eye muscles because when you're looking at something up close your eyes are forced to come together so your convergence muscles are in play when you look at something that is far away then it is actually sort of like gps recalculating for your eye and your brain and the muscles come back to base position there is also something called the 1 2 10 rule whereby you're supposed to put your phone at least a foot away from your eyes you're supposed to put your laptop or tablet at least 2 feet away from your eyes and watch tv from at least 10 feet away for younger children there is something called the 22 rule whereby you allow them 20 minutes of screen followed by 2 hours of no screen play in fact outside activity minimum even for adults should be at least 30 minutes of vigorous activity headaches are avoided by putting screens at eye level you put the light source behind the student not behind your screen and again follow the 20 20 20 rule with dry eyes remember to blink when we are focusing on something our blink reflex will slow down automatically so you have to remember that every 10 seconds your eyes need lubrication and the method of lubrication is blinking when you blink there is a windshield wiper motion that actually spreads your tear film across your eye and that is important also remember you need to drink enough water there is poor sleep quality because stimulation of the eyes and the brain a minimum of 1 hour before sleep actually decreases the production of the sleep hormone melatonin so you should institute a no screen rule 1 to 2 hours before sleep in covid-19 the inflammatory markers go up very high in some cases those patients in whom the inflammatory markers are high are put on systemic steroids there are four important ocular side effects of corticosteroids you can get steroid induced glaucoma you can get cataract formation delayed wound healing and there is an increased susceptibility to infection however these effects are on long term use of steroid short term use of steroid like there is in covid-19 its effects yet have to be studied 
and the effects of this have been seen to be a transient increase in intraocular pressure, especially in patients who are steroid responders, a central serous choroidopathy, and pigment epithelial detachment. The, the way we know that these are steroid um, dependent is because they usually regress on withdrawal of the steroid. A case in point, this is an ocular uh, coherence tomography of a patient who was on prednisone, 40 milligrams for 10 days following a COVID-19 infection. The patient is a female, 42 year old, and after COVID, she used 40 milligrams of prednisone for, uh, for 10 days, following which she shifted to the recommended dexamethasone, 6 milligrams, for a further 10 days. She got her COVID infection on, um, on the 2020th or the 21st of October. On the 23rd of November, she noted that she was having um, distorted vision in one eye. When she went to get this ocular tomography scan done, you can see the difference between, if you are looking at the screen, the pictures on the left hand side actually depict the right eye. The pictures on the right hand side depict the left eye. On the right eye, you can see, those are the layers of the retina. You can see the central dip, which is the macula, and the fovea, which are responsible for equity of vision. The layer below, the line below, that is your pigment epithelium. The steroid, as you can see in the pictures of the left eye, actually caused thinning of the retinal pigment epithelium. It caused the break. You can see that as a small bump on the retinal pigment epithelium. And the blackening is actually collection of fluid in that potential space. These were scans which were taken on the 23rd of November 2020. With the withdrawal of the steroid, you can see the scans one week later. Again, the right eye shows no change, but if you look at the left eye, the break has sealed and the fluid has actually resorbed. And this is one week after withdrawing steroid therapy. The take home message here is that we can institute all sorts of therapies, but we need to know that the effect goes way beyond what we assume it to be in the body. So eye examination is actually mandatory for all patients on steroid therapy. The protocols that were instituted in eye care during the COVID-19 pandemic aside from the usual infection prevention control protocols that are instituted in all health facilities for all healthcare workers, specific precautions need to be followed by eye care professionals to ensure minimum transmission and infection. Like the dentists, like the ENT specialists, and like the gynecologists, eye care professionals are at a higher risk of contracting COVID-19, number one, because they always work in close proximity to the patient. Number two, because the work generates aerosols and the proximity to the nose whereby the aerosols reside is also a problem. So it was decided initially that all procedures should be limited to emergencies only and follow-ups extended as much as possible with drug prescriptions being filled for months. And then a filter clinic needed to be set up and a high index of suspicion maintained. Any patient suspected to be having COVID-19 should be taken to the holding, holding rooms immediately and proper protocol to be followed. High risk patients who are elderly patients with comorbidities need to be seen but to be dealt with quickly to minimize their level of exposure in the hospital. Patients seating and flow need to be well controlled to ensure quick checking and quick exit from the hospital setting. Since eye examination involves close contact with patients and procedures generate aerosols, as we said, the patient and examiner should both be masked and should both use hand sanitizer before every examination. Indirect methods of examination are preferred to direct methods. For example, 
If you have to do an ophthalmoscopy, rather than doing an in, a direct ophthalmoscopy, an indirect ophthalmoscopy, which is usually done at a one foot distance, should be employed for um, tonometry, measurement of the pressure of the eye, rather than doing a contact tonometry, a non-contact tonometry is preferred to reduce the chances of transmission through that. These are just two examples. Then the examiner should be protected with a face mask or goggles where possible. A screen or breath guard should be placed on the slit lamp between the patient and the examiner. And the patient is encouraged not to speak during the examination because as we know, speaking and talking also generates aerosols and in that close proximity, the chances of transmission are higher. In case a patient suspected of COVID-19 requires an urgent examination or a procedure, full PPE needs to be instituted in the form of a gown, gloves, surgical mask, and eye protection. These are recommended for the clinician. An N95 mask needs to be worn if the procedure will result in aerosolized virus. For example, in the eyes, orbital abscess surgery with a functional endoscopic sinus surgery or a decreosisterhinostomy is planned. These are examples of the protection that needs to be worn by healthcare workers. The first is the breath uh, guard or shield that is placed um, between the examiner and the patient. The second one is goggles and you can see that these are wraparound goggles which protect even the sides before uh, to limit entry of any virus through the conjunctiva. And this is a face shield. If it is possible to use all of this, it is so much better for the practitioner. There are many questions which arise. In fact, these are questions that arise in the minds of healthcare workers as well as the routine uh, general public. Can COVID-19 transmit through the eyes? The eye has a mucosal surface. This surface has angiotensin enzyme 2 receptors. So yes, it can serve as a point of entry for the SARS-CoV-2. You can become infected by touching a contaminated surface, then touching your eyes. There is conjunctivitis in COVID-19. How do you differentiate conjunctivitis in COVID-19 from a normal adenoviral conjunctivitis? Frankly, clinically, they both appear the same. Even when a PCR is done of conjunctival secretions in a COVID-19 positive patients, patient, the conjunctival secretions can still come back negative for SARS-CoV-2. Is it present though in the conjunctival secretions of patients suffering from COVID-19? Yes, it is present. Just that it might not always be at detectable levels. In July 2020, a case report was made of the development of conjunctivitis as a sole symptom of a patient with COVID-19. The patient was a healthcare worker, an emergency healthcare worker. The patient's first application was to the ophthalmology clinic because of redness, stinging, tearing, and photophobia for one day only in the right eye. There were no other fever um, in symptoms suggestive of COVID-19 like fever, cough, shortness of breath, or fatigue. But because this is an emergency healthcare worker who is one of the high risk population, and because conjunctivitis has been one of the presenting symptoms, um, two days later, the RT-PCR tests, blood analysis, and CT were done because the patient had been in contact with a COVID positive patient. The conjunctival swabs did not identify the SARS-CoV-2 by PCR. However, the nasal, nasopharyngeal swab and the blood test confirmed the diagnosis of COVID-19. So you can see the patient presented with a conjunctivitis, but the conjunctival, conjunctival secretions were negative for COVID-19, although the patient themselves were positive. So high index of suspicion is extremely necessary. So question arises now. If the virus is present in conjunctival secretions, is it possible to get infected by handling these secretions of an infected patient? In essence, I am being asked, without gloves, can I handle an eye? 
a study done in Egypt in July 2020 to assess SARS-CoV-2 virus in conjunctival, conjunctival tears and secretions of 28 positive confirmed COVID-19 patients concluded that the virus can be found in tears and conjunctival, conjunctival secretions of SARS-CoV-2 patients who have conjunctivitis or not. So conjunctivitis is not a, a precluding, I mean, it's, it's not a necessary factor for that conjunctival secretion to be positive for SARS-CoV-2. Out of the 10 patients who had conjunctival manifestations, three patients had SARS-CoV-2 in their conjunctiva using a reverse transcriptase uh, PCR test. Out of the 18 patients who had no conjunctival manifestations, five patients had positive SARS-CoV-2 in their conjunctiva using the RT-PCR test. So yes, it is possible to get infected because the virus is carried in the secretions. Thus, adequate infection prevention control protocols should be followed at all times. The question that is buzzing in people's minds now is to do with vaccines. Since we got the vaccines in Kenya, do the vaccines for COVID-19 affect the eyes? Generally, COVID-19 vaccines so far have not been tied to serious vision issues. There has been one isolated incident of an eye-related side effect seen in a health worker in Alaska who experienced eye puffiness after getting a COVID-19 shot. The US FDA is investigating this among other rare allergic reactions to the coronavirus vaccine produced by the Pfizer and BioNTech. So as my colleague in Kiambu says, this is an infection. It is a highly infective virus, all right? You should not raise the level of fear, but we should be smart enough to follow prevention protocols like masking and hand washing and keep a high index of suspicion. Any suspected cases need to be isolated immediately, need to be tested immediately, need to be contact traced immediately to prevent any further effects occurring for patients for whom it might be fatal. So protect yourself, protect those you love. Thank you.